Uh, and uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, we're live streaming on Facebook and uh, also uh, we're also broadcasting on FM 87.9. So if you want to tune that in in your cars, it's 87.9. Um, want to mention as well that our annual congregational meeting will take place today on Zoom at noon. And if you have difficulty logging in, uh, my mobile number, I've, I've sent it out in the email, just call me starting at 1130 and I'll help you get on to, to the meeting. So um, anyway, that'll take place today at noon. So we're glad to see you. Let us join now in our call to worship, which comes from Psalm 96. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless God's name. Tell of God's salvation from day to day. Declare God's glory among the nations, God's marvelous works to all the peoples. Hear now our call to confession. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sins to God. Please join me in our prayer of confession. O oh God, you call to us, but we pretend not to hear. We've ignored the cries of our neighbors and your challenge for us to live in new ways with you. Saving God, forgive us. Help us to change. Help us to follow where you lead. Help us to not fear tomorrow, for you are already there. Amen. Let us now continue to confess our sins in silence. Amen. Receive now the declaration of pardon. Hear the good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven.
please join me in our prayer for illumination. Gracious God, grant us stillness of mind and purity of heart to receive the good news this day. Amen. Our gospel lesson comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. So listen now for God's word as it speaks to you. Jesus and the disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying with a loud voice came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Announcements come in many forms. You get a baby announcement in the mail and you think, this is great news, and you know it's true. After all, why would somebody lie about having a baby? But we get other announcements via snail mail or email that look like good news, but that you know are definitely not true. Dearest John, I am a Nigerian prince, and because you're a Christian man, I would like to give you $1 million if you would help me transfer $100 million to America. Please help me by sending me your Social Security number at your earliest convenience to my barrister via the link below. That announcement, when it arrives, is definitely not good news, and it's not true. Sometimes good news is announced by a good friend. The king of late night Johnny Carson had his longtime pal and sidekick Ed McMahon announce for decades to the millions watching The Tonight Show what it was they're watching, who the guests were, and who their host was by saying, we all know this, here's Johnny. Still other times good news is announced not by a friend, but by an adversary, if not an outright foe. If you've ever watched American Idol or X Factor, you know that all the contestants had to get by the villainously harsh judge, Simon Cowell. The British-born Cowell would sit there with a know-it-all grin, delivering brutally honest judgments that could make dreams come true or instantly kill careers. Contestants knew that Cowell was not their friend. He was their critic. And if they were not sufficiently skilled, Cowell would announce the truth, a truth that could be trusted even if it was a truth that was delivered by a foe. We get that right up front in the Gospel of Mark, then the story that Mark is telling us in our passage today, an announcer who tells the truth about Jesus, not because he's Jesus' friend, but precisely because he is Jesus' foe. Jesus is in Capernaum, a Galilean fishing town. He's in the synagogue, and Jesus is teaching boldly, laying down the word of God with authority. Suddenly, a man with an unclean spirit involuntarily shouts out, Just what do you think you're doing, Jesus? Yes, you, Jesus of Nazareth, I know you. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Jesus hears this and shouts back, Shut up and go to hell. And the unclean spirit crying bloody murder comes out of the man's convulsing body, leaving him right before Jesus, right there. And the word spread that this man, this God-man, this Jesus, his teachings, his deeds, they are righteous. He is righteous. Jesus is an authority. Jesus is something else. 
C.S. Lewis famously said, either Jesus was completely crazy or he was exactly who he said he was. Here Jesus' deeds speak louder than words, but there are words too, words announced by Jesus' foe, declaring that Jesus is the real deal. Stories like the one we have today from Mark's gospel are hard for us to deal with. We don't know exactly to what make of them. I think that's because over the years, people like me in the religious industrial complex have, have watered down Jesus. We preside over the rituals that have domesticated Jesus into a cleaned up, tamed down, consumer tested, child friendly, seeker sensitive buddy for all of us who want to feel better about ourselves. Truth is though, that Jesus didn't come to sweeten up this old world. He came to usher in a new one. Sometimes the best way to understand that and get that word is to receive it not from a conventional preacher like me, but from someone who's a little less concerned about our delicate sensibilities. Someone like Carl. A bunch of us met Carl some years ago when we went to serve an evening meal to 200 homeless men in downtown Indianapolis at the Wheeler Rescue Mission. Carl was the kitchen steward who gave us our jobs and supervised our work. And when we were all done and cleaned up, we asked for a tour of the place. And Carl said, sure, I'll show you around. But how about we start with me? It wasn't a question. Heroin made me homeless. Jesus made me whole. I lived on the street for 10 years. Before that, I had a good job, a loving wife, great kids, a wonderful future. But I lost all of that to shooting up. When I ended up fired, divorced, and homeless, I ended up on the streets living like an animal. I've seen things that no one should see. My life was a walking death. I got to the point where I wanted to die. I prayed over and over and over, Lord, take me. And the Lord did. The Lord took me off the street, and Jesus brought me here to the Wheeler Rescue Mission. When I gave my life to Jesus, he got me off heroin. I'm clean because of him. Now I'm in Wheeler's Life with a Purpose program. I go to recovery meetings. I'm learning a trade. I'm even saving up to get my own apartment. For 10 years, I was an animal. Now I'm a man. And I tell everybody this. It doesn't matter how bad you think you've messed up because if you give your life to Jesus, he will save you. That's what he does. That's what he did for me. Now, to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, either Carl is completely crazy or he is where he is because Jesus is exactly who Jesus claimed to be. How many of us here believe in Jesus, believe that, yes, Lord, you are who you say you are? But how many of us believe that but also do not believe that that matters one bit to our lives today? Oh, sure, Jesus will do what he does. He'll save me when I die, years from now, in the sweet by and by. But whatever Jesus is going to do for me, he's going to do it then and only then. Well, not so according to the Bible. Not so according to Carl. When you give your life to Jesus again and again and again, that changes you. Sometimes changing us in dramatic ways. Sometimes changing us in incremental ways. But always changing us in ways so that our lives are changed for good. And not just when we die, but also right now. That doesn't mean that Jesus makes everything all right. Jesus doesn't whisk away the consequences of our past choices. Jesus doesn't miracle away the pain of past years. You should have seen Carl. You could tell how those years of hard living had aged him. His weathered face was deeply wrinkled. His voice was gravelly. His arms were covered with do-it-yourself tattoos, leathery scars, and needle marks. He looked like hell. 
but hell didn't hold him anymore. He had a new future. He was building on his dreams. He was helping others. His relationship with the Lord was alive. Carl spoke about his relationship with Jesus in such a way that you could tell his very life depended on it. Because it did, and it does, just like our lives do as well. The spiritual writer Kathleen Norris says that from antiquity up until about 150 years ago, if someone was really plagued and tormented, that people would say, that person has a demon. Today, Norris notes, people don't say that much anymore. Today we say, that person has issues. Like Norris, I don't think it matters too much what you call it, because the misery is the same. Did Carl have a demon, or did Carl have issues? Doesn't matter, because whatever we want to call it, that it almost killed him, and that it was conquered by Christ. If we think about everyone in the Wabash Avenue family of faith, I don't think anyone of us in this congregation would say about someone else that they have a demon. But I think that we would all agree that every single one of us, me included, have issues. We drink too much, or we have an eating disorder, or we've never recovered from a tragedy, or we're worried we're stuck in a stalled career, or a lukewarm marriage, or that we're going to outlive our money. We've got a troubled child or a struggling spouse or a failing parent or a dysfunctional family. All of us, me included, have issues that keep us from living our best lives now. We've got problems, things that have exiled us from our life, from our best days and brightest hopes and greatest dreams. Jesus is the one who can help all of us exiles get home. And not just get home as in get us to heaven after we give up the ghost. No, Jesus is the one who calls us by name in order to bring us to his side, in order to make us fully alive today. What if that unclean spirit was right, that Jesus is here to destroy death? What if Carl is right? that Jesus is here to destroy death by giving us life, a brand new life with him. If that's true, then Jesus is here today, right now, to make you a new creation, a new person, one whose life can be filled with compassion, gentleness, hope, and love. If you have things that are stifling your life, Jesus can resurrect you and help you toward a brand new future. Maybe like Carl, you need your, to get yourself regularly to recovery meetings. Maybe you need to work on an unresolved issue with a counselor or therapist who can help you work with God to overcome what has been troubling you for so long. Maybe you need to listen to your doctor who's been urging you for some time to make a change you've been refusing. Whatever it is that has exiled you from the life God seeks to give you, Jesus can get you there. Whatever you fear, Christ can conquer. Just turn to him and work with him, and a new day will dawn. Thank heavens that new day already has. It is here because Jesus Christ is risen today. You can be resurrected too. Jesus will not fail you. Let us pray. Oh God, we praise you for your saving love and resurrecting power that is here today to heal the world and raise us all to new life with you. Help us to welcome that new life and work with you, trusting in your amazing grace and unfailing love which shall make us a new creation. Help us to share your grace and love with our neighbors, community, and world. Continue, O oh God, to deliver us all from this pandemic. Guide our leaders that they may lead all nations to peace. Guide us all to live together in harmony. 
Help us to believe the best about each other and to build a more perfect union with our countrymen and with you. Bless, we pray, all the ministries beyond the congregation housed in our facility, the fish clothing pantry, the Montessori school, child and family counseling, and the recovering meetings. May your blessings flow through their work that our community and world may receive what it needs to flourish and all persons receive what they need to become who you created them to be. We pray for those in need of healing, for all who are ill with the coronavirus, including Mike and Emma. We pray for those who are quarantining. We ask your richest blessings for Alger and Noreen's friend Patricia, we pray for Debbie and her chemotherapy. We pray for Jim, Becky, Nanette, Nancy, for Roger to remain cancer-free and COVID-free, for Betty and Dick and all of Dick's loved ones. Bless Bill and Linda, Peg, at Dave and Alex, Alan and Barb, and Pam and Barb. Bless all who grieve including all who grieved the death of two high school students in the automobile accident on Thursday. Comfort all who are bereft from that tragedy. We ask your grace as well upon those who mourn, including Nancy, Mandy, Kyle, Brittany, Jim, Nanette, Charlie, Marty, Stephanie, Carrie, Joyce, Don and Dottie, and all in Arlene Painter's family. Bless Kevin and Laura. Bless all students, teachers, and all who work in our schools. Protect Hillary's grandfather, Lloyd, all nursing home and assisted living residents, and all who serve to protect us during this pandemic. We would also now ask that you would receive these, our silent prayers. O oh God, we thank you for receiving our prayers and for receiving us as your forgiven, redeemed, and loved children. Unite us now in one voice in the prayer that our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Receive now the charge and the benediction. I charge us all to remember Martin Luther's definition of sin. Martin Luther said that what sin is, is disbelieving the promises of God, that believing that they don't apply to you. The good news is that they do. God's promises are yours. Let us go forth now trusting in those promises, sharing God's grace and love with all. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn a shining face toward you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.